Thank you so much, Sue. And it is such a pleasure to be here um, back on campus. Although when I was a student at the Ford School, we definitely did not have an auditorium like this. We were over on the fourth floor of Lorch. So to all of the current students, your lot has improved greatly um, <laughs> compared to previous graduates. But nonetheless, it was one of the best experiences of my life. So I'm very pleased to be here. And as Sue mentioned, definitely um, interrupt with questions. I um, usually present to audiences of economists that aren't shy. And the sort of biggest insult is to not ask any questions at all. So do not hold back. Um, and as Sue mentioned, today I'm going to be looking at federal student aid, and in particular the Pell Grant program and college pricing, and looking at how institutions respond to their students' Pell Grants. Um, great. So, um, you know, we all are in the field of higher education, so I probably don't need to spend much time motivating why we should care about affordability and access to college. There's an extensive literature in labor economics suggesting there are large private returns to earning a college degree, and there's suggestive evidence of positive spillovers from having a highly educated um, workforce. However, some students face credit constraints and can't borrow against their future income to finance college education, then the overall level of education in the population may be inefficiently low. So this is one of the main rationale that the federal government and state governments use um, to justify their provision of need-based student aid. The largest of these programs, as Sue mentioned, is the federal Pell Grant program. Um, and I should say, by need-based student aid, what I mean is that at least one of the criteria for eligibility um, is, um, depends on family income. So you have to be sufficiently needy, hence the name. Um, but back to the Pell Grant program. So the federal Pell Grant program um, is the largest source of need-based aid in the US. In 2011, nine and a half million students received $35 billion in aid through this program. Um, it is a large proportion of the Department of Education's discretionary budget. And what I'm going to be looking at today is essentially for every, say, $100 of Pell Grant aid a given student gets, how much does this actually reduce their cost of attendance? How does this actually reduce the price that they pay? Um, and the answer to this depends on whether this aid sticks where it hits. So um, from an economist's perspective, we can think of this in a tax instance framework, so students are the statutory recipients or the sort of um, party that is entitled to receive Pell Grant aid, but they may not receive the full economic benefit if schools also respond to the fact by um, raising tuition or lowering institutional aid. So this, so I'll start. yes, so great. You could also think of it in the fly paper framework, right, where it's mm -hmm. one level of government, the federal government, mm -hmm. sending funds down to another level. Right. To what extent does that actually change total spending on it? Yes, yes. Although in this case, the, the intended recipient from the federal government's perspective is the student, not the school. But it, there is definitely, costs, yes, you know, yes, exactly. Tuition prices, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. most of the students are going to public institutions. Mm -hmm. Yep, so yep, so you're subsidizing public schools, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, there is definitely a close tie between sort of a, um, a, a thinking about subsidy incidents and the flypaper literature. Great, yes, don't hold back with questions, please. Um, okay, so this paper is also motivated by a shift in the organization of higher education with the emergence and growth of the for-profit sector over the past, say, 20 years. So these are schools um, like University of Phoenix, ITT Tech, um, many smaller single-standing institutions that disproportionately serve low-income students, such as Pell Grant recipients. Um, and over the past you know, five to 10 years, there's been a growing concern of these schools. Um, there's been allegations of deceptive marketing practices and that these schools are taking advantage of federal aid programs. Um, so in this paper, I'm going to specifically look at the for-profit sector and see whether their response to Pell Grant aid and the fact that their students, say, get a $100 Pell Grant, how, if that differs from the responses of other schools. Okay, great. So, um, I'm going to just broad sweeps, talk about what I'll talk about for the rest of this time. Um, I'll briefly go through sort of what do we know about federal aid crowd out in higher education, um, spend most of the time talking about my paper, and then since this is a policy seminar, spend probably not enough time talking about um, what are the policy implications of my findings. Um, great. 
So my paper is not the first to look at this question, do schools respond to the fact that their students are getting sort of federal grants or federal loans. Um, this behavior actually has a name. It's called the Bennett Hypothesis, um, named after a former Secretary of Education that essentially asserted if we increase federal grant aid by $100, colleges will just respond by increasing tuition by $100. And sort of the pass-through from students to schools will be 100% with students not benefiting at all. Um, right, so there's been sort of a number of papers looking at this question um, in terms of tuition increases. Um, and the identification or sort of how these papers are going to disentangle the impact of changes in need-based aid on changes in tuition is time series variation in the maximum Pell Grant award. So that's what this figure is showing. Um, so this, this green um, line is the maximum Pell Grant award students could receive in a given year since the program's inception in 1974 um, in nominal terms. And the blue line is the maximum Pell Grant award um, in inflation adjusted terms. So just looking at this picture, sort of there, there may be concern if we're sort of looking at how tuition changes as the maximum Pell Grant award changes and inferring a causal sort of channel. Um, for instance, if you focus on the late 1990s, these were a, a, um, you know, good economic times and these are the years when the real value of the maximum Pell Grant award increased by the largest amount. Um, and I could tell similar stories sort of about this variation being correlated with other things going on in the economy that may affect schools' decisions or um, states' decisions over tuition. Um, and so not surprisingly, this research sort of finds inconclusive evidence with some papers finding Pell Grants increased tuition, some papers finding Pell Grants decreased tuition. Um, and furthermore, one thing I'd like to emphasize is really this channel of increasing tuition is maybe not the way schools would choose to go after Pell Grant aid. Um, so for most schools, Pell Grant aid really is a drop in the bucket of total resources. Yes? So just to, you know, I know the answer to this question. <laughs> okay, great. Like, by identification, you mean so, so inferring a causal relationship rather than a correlation. So by identification, what I am saying is we want to say, we, the question I'm at, they're asking is, does Pell Grant aid cause tuition to increase? Right? Or do increases in Pell Grant aid cause tuition to increase? Um, my argument is that these papers can show that increases in Pell Grant aid are correlated with increases in tuition in some cases and, and not so in others. But we can't look at this correlation and infer a causal relationship because changes in the maximum Pell Grant award are correlated with lots of other things going on that may also affect tuition. Thank you. <laughs> yes? So you're going to be answering the question of uh, incidents. But I'm also, as a public economist, interested in the, in the quantity response, right? So mm -hmm. there's going to be an increase in supply, which I guess is coming from these for profits. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk a little bit. Mainly, or is there also a, uh, you're going to be able to expand on this later, or should be able to get a quantity responses? So and see how much, it, where it's coming from. And then mm -hmm. we get all the different elasticities of supply and demand of, of education. It would be, it would be awesome. <laughs> so if, um, if you all invite me back in, say, a year's time, I <laughs> would be happy to give that paper. That's not something I'm going to talk about today, but that is something that is important. I have, you know, pay lip service to this at the end. So what I'm going to show you today is sort of the very short run response of schools to Pell Grant aid, not allowing for entry, right? But in the long run, exactly. If, in fact, I find schools are capturing Pell Grant aid, then this may induce other schools to enter the market. Well, if you're not allowing for entry, then you're holding supply fixed, then theoretically in a competitive market, then so this, the hypothesis will be right. So this market is far from being perfectly competitive, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Yep, yep. So um, the setup is coming. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So I mean, most 80% of it is public. So right there, it, it, it's not, this is not a, a profit maximizing, you know, 80% of these students are attending public institutions and then another, what, 10 are going to nonprofits and then 8%, 10% are going to for-profits. That, so yeah, so. Um, for-profit 
on average, right? We still might think for-profits would respond, and there is some evidence that they do, but in the short run, in the very short run, in a given year, they're sort of not going to be able to respond, and that's, that's why, and, and Sue is exactly right. So the majority of Pell Grant recipients are attending public institutions. Um, although there is this growing proportion going to for-profit schools. Okay, so, so really what I'm going to argue is that for the vast majority of schools, which are by and large public schools serving Pell Grant recipients, tuition isn't the margin through which schools want to respond. Um, and the one exception is the for-profit sector. So these schools, um, some of them serve up to 90% of the students in their population are receiving Pell Grants. So this may be sort of the one sector that we might think would respond on the tuition margin. Um, and just to say, like, why is the for-profit sector important? Well, actually they received 25% of all Pell Grant awards in 2011. So this number has been growing. A few years ago it was 80% um, or less than, you know, around 10% and now it's 25%. Um, so just, just a little, little diversion about the for-profit sector that I think is rarely focused on. Um, this figure is graphing the for-profit share of all Pell Grant aid, and when people talk about sort of the dramatic increase in Pell Grant aid going to for-profit schools, they're focusing on the, the data points that are sort of after this line that I'm drawing. So if you start in like 1994, you see there's a large growth. Um, but if we were to sort of extend this time series going back, we actually see that this, this point that we start at is the bottom of a trough. And in the late 80s, there was actually another spike in the proportion of Pell Grant dollars going to the for-profit sector. Um, sort of what led to this decrease? Well, there was tightening of federal student loan regulations. There was sort of many for-profits that exited the market. Um, this is not something I'm going to talk about, but I think it's an interesting fact that doesn't get mentioned a lot when thinking about the for-profit sector. So why are, why are we more worried in more recent years? Well, part of the reason is that Overall, Pell Grant aid, which is this green line, has increased dramatically. So even though if we look in 2000, 2009 and the percentage of students attending for-profit schools, it's around 25%, which is similar to the percentage back in the late 80s. The percentage attending for-profits is not 25%. The percentage of Pell Grant dollars, yeah. yes. That, are you going to have a time series on the share attending? Um, no, but it is. That's the 10% that I was referring to. Okay. So it's at a high right now, about 10%, where... 10 years ago, it was maybe like 5%. Mm -hmm. So it's growing as well, right. So this is a share of Pell Grant aid. Um, but let's get into it. But let's get into it, <laughs> exactly. So uh, this cycle. Yes. Um, the first of like, uh, you know, cyclical scaling upward. Mm -hmm. what, is, what do you speculate that could be the further proof of this? So, my speculation is that it's, re it's related to regulation with respect to student loan default rates um, and eligibility, and which affects eligibility for federal student aid. My, my point here is that this pattern that we've seen over the last 10 years is not unusual if we're thinking about the share of Pell Grant aid. What is unusual is the total amount of money on the table, right? So 25% of $5 billion is a lot less than 25% of $35 billion. So sort of thinking about the sheer magnitude of dollars. <laughs> um, so, so even though this, this cycle is something we've seen before, it's perhaps more relevant now, yes. Uh, do you ever read Brad Kirsch's handbook chapter? I've read his paper on He's got a Pell Grant. 60 page handbook chapter in higher ed handbook of theory and research okay. on Pell Grant. Okay. From 70s all the way through to present day. And you'll know why the spikes are there, why the costs are there. Okay, great. Was, so Singel, who is a reference, mm -hmm. that was a student. Brad mm -hmm. Beck, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Right. I checked that out. The other thing that changed was the definition of who's eligible for Pell. Yes. Yes. So um, in the past, you had to have received a high school diploma or GED to receive a Pell Grant award. And then in the 90s, this um, requirement was loosened and schools just had to show that you had the ability to benefit from higher education. Also in this sort of period, 
the regulation regarding online education was loosened. So schools before had to serve a certain amount of students in person, and that, that regulation was loosened, which sort of hastened the entry of schools that serve a mainly online audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to tell you the exact date this regulation changed because I'm not going to say something wrong on videotape um, <laughs> or in general, um, but it was in the, um, around that period, right? Okay, so great. Um, okay, so, so the for-profit sector sort of, maybe we've seen this before, but maybe not because of the sheer amount of money on the table. Um, and they're th sort of the only sector where Pell Grant aid could constitute a significant share of total revenue. I just want to pay lip service to this recent paper by Stephanie Cellini and Claudia Golden, who are sort of looking at this tuition margin. And they find that um, for-profit schools that are primarily offering sort of lower than associate's degree programs do increase tuition relative to schools that can't disperse federal aid, um, suggesting that the Bennett hypothesis may be appropriate for the for-profit sector. Um, but in other sectors, I'm going to argue that sort of the, the real margin on which schools should respond will not be the tuition margin. So what's the sort of setup or the framework I have in mind? And how does the financial aid process work? So students that wish to um, qualify for federal student aid, this is loans and Pell Grant aid, have to submit a FAFSA, a free application for federal student aid. Um, if you've gone to college recently or have kids who've gone to college recently, you know how this works. Um, it's fairly complicated. You input a lot of information about family income assets structure, and um, it gets put through a complicated formula. And what comes out is the federal government's measure of need, your expected family contribution. Um, then this information gets provided to the schools the student is interested in attending. Um, most students who are sort of new college entrants only list one school on their FAFSA, so they're only considering one. Um, and at this point, schools observe this measure of need, the expected family contribution. They observe everything that went into the FAFSA, so family income, assets, family structure. Um, they and then they calculate the student's eligibility for outside aid. So they calculate how much of a federal Pell Grant you're eligible for, how much state grants you're eligible for. And at that point, they decide how much to give you in terms of an institutional grant or a discount from the list price of tuition. So the world I have in mind is one where schools set an overall level of tuition, but then prices are going to vary, sometimes substantially across students, um, through these individual discounts or through the provision of institutional aid. And this is exactly the margin that I am interested in examining. Um, so in, in economics, we refer to this as price discrimination. And colleges and universities are in a somewhat ideal situation to practice price discrimination, since they observe sort of a, a great deal of information about students, including a measure of their willingness or ability to pay. Um, so specifically, I'm going to be looking at how this sort of more flexible component of price, the individual discount, varies as a student's Pell Grant award varies. Um, I'm using data from the National Post-Secondary Student Aid Study. It's a nationally representative cross-section of college students attending schools in all different sectors of higher education, so public schools, um, nonprofit schools, for-profit schools. Um, and just to, to be very clear here, the specific questions I'm going to be looking at are um, a, what is the economic incidence of Pell Grant aid? Um, or specifically, how much of every Pell Grant dollar is passed through from the intended recipients, from students to schools? And then second, I'm going to be looking at whether this behavior varies across different sectors of higher education, where I'm defining the sector by the control of the school, so public, private, or nonprofit, and by selectivity. And selectivity is going to be sort of different than the way we generally think about things as um, faculty or students at um, University of Michigan, University of Maryland, um, it's going to be a binary indicator for whether a school is open admission, so it accepts sort of every student that comes through its doors, or whether it has some, um, it, it rejects some number of applicants. On average, these are not going to be highly selective institutions. They are not going to be University of Michigan, Harvard, Columbia. These are going to be schools that are on average accepting around 60% of their applicants. 
Yes. Can you help me think about price discrimination for nonprofit schools? I, so you say how much of every dollar is passed through schools. When I think about price discrimination, I think of some firm owner who's then going to put the money in his pocket. Mm -hmm. but if I, you know, if more money comes to Michigan, then the students somehow, you would think, get that back. Right. So the school is still going to want to maximize its total pot of money to use for whatever its objectives are. So it may not be to maximize profits. It may be to offer scholarships to really poor students or to build new dorms. Um, but given that sort of schools observe how much students are able to pay, then they're going to use this information to figure out what exact price students would be willing to pay to come. Which way the transfer goes. So this is, this is complicated, and I'll get to it. That's a good question, but stay tuned, right? I have to have some suspense. Um, so, so does behavior vary across sectors? Let's sort of preview, yes, it does. And then can we say something about differences in what schools care about or in schools' objectives from how they respond to Pell Grant aid? And yes, we can. Um, OK. Um, so I, I made this argument earlier that this variation that other people have used in the maximum Pell Grant award, this time series variation, is maybe problematic because there's other things going on that also vary with the maximum Pell Grant award. What I'm going to take advantage of is the fact that most students um, who receive Pell Grants or most eligible students receive less than the maximum award. And how much Pell Grant aid I specifically receive is going to be both a function of the maximum Pell Grant award and this measure of need that the federal government calculated, my expected family contribution. Um, and I'll talk exactly how this formula works in the next slide, and I've already talked about how the expected family contribution works. Okay, so this figure is graphing how much Pell Grant aid students received in my sample of NIPSAS students um, according to their distance from the Pell Grant eligibility threshold. So just to be clear, all of these students over here are receiving no Pell Grant aid, and they are, have an EFC, an expected family contribution, that makes them ineligible for Pell Grant aid. Um, and then students to your left of the eligibility threshold are eligible for the Pell Grant program, and they are receiving positive amounts of Pell Grant aid. So each one of these circles represents the average amount of Pell Grant aid received by students who are a particular distance from the eligibility threshold. OK? Great. So. So it's driven by the formula. Um, so this formula specifies that. So what's the distance? Sorry, what's the distance measurement? It's your expected family contribution standardized to represent the distance from the threshold. So every student gets this expected family contribution EFC, and in a given year there is some maximum value of EFC above which no one is going to receive a Pell Grant, um, below which students receive this minimum Pell Grant award, which is four hundred dollars in the years I'm looking at. And then as your need increases for every dollar, your statutory Pell Grant award also increases by a dollar. Okay? And this is, this is all just based on the federal government's formula. Um, and this is going to lead to two sources of variation that I can use to get at this causal question. Um, so not just how is Pell Grant aid correlated with institutional aid, but does Pell Grant aid affect institutional aid? Does Pell Grant aid cause institutional aid to fall or rise? Just, just to clarify, so you put, you, you figure a distance of say minus 2,000, mm -hmm. and we're seeing people getting about 1,300 around that. So what's accounting for that $700 difference? That so imperfect take up, yes. So non-compliance and um, if you do not stay enrolled for the full year, uh, you don't get your full Pell Grant, okay. right? So if everyone was taking up and everyone was staying enrolled, it would be, a di it would be almost a diagonal to $400. There's also an adjustment for whether you're full-time, part-time, or quarter-time. Uh, and roughly, like, what part of the term, say if you're talking about someone coming in, like, fall, semester, of the academic year, like, is it, like, middle of the term? Is it, like, the first few weeks of the term where basically... When are they getting the award? Like when, maybe I don't quite understand the question I want to answer, but want to answer, but like when, it, there's, a, is there, there's a point in the term where basically the institutions get to keep, keep the funds? No, 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 no. Okay. Um, no, either you 
students qualify or they don't. If they right? drop out within a certain uh, distance. The <laughs> Colleen, you know the answer? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, if, a student <laughs> drops out, if a student drops out uh, at a certain percentage of the way through the semester, then the, school, the institution essentially keeps the top funds. Right. I see. But this is not actually the institution. So, but this isn't the institution keeping it, it's that the student still has to pay tuition. It's, yeah, it's essentially the, yeah. So the student gets to keep it, right, because they're still on the hook for tuition. Yes, but the, so they essentially then they end up owing money to the school in the amount of the Pell Grant, if that makes sense. So. They owe the school tuition. Yeah. Okay. Right, so if the student drops out too soon, they're not going to get their Pell Grant award, but they still owe the school is what you're saying. Correct, but after a certain point in time during the semester, then the school keeps essentially all of the aid and the student might still have some funds to pay the school if they haven't paid their bill for whatever reason, for example. That time period would be usually after the drop out. Right, yeah. right. But that's not what this is about. I mean, this, no. this distance from the maximum is about part-time versus full-time. If you look at this separately, yeah. I mean, I looked at this, this particular NIPSAS, this particular graph, it's basically if you look at the full-time people, it looks right, and then this is people who are going part-time. Yes, I've got many experts in the audience. Yes. Uh -huh. The best kind of audience. Okay, great. So, so there's two sources of variation in Pell Grant awards that I'm going to use to disentangle this causal question. So the first is this discontinuous increase in students' Pell Grant award as you say move from being a dollar above the threshold to a dollar below the threshold and this is driven by this minimum Pell Grant award so no one receives less than $400 in Pell Grant aid if you qualify for a Pell Grant award and um, for the people who like econometrics in the room I can use this discontinuous change in the level in a regression discontinuity design. The second source of variation I'm going to take advantage of is a discontinuous change in the relationship between need and Pell Grant aid. So specifically what I mean by this is for ineligible students, we can think about sort of increasing their need by a dollar, right? So we take a student out a year and we increase their need by a dollar, but there's zero dollars change in their Pell Grant award, right? They're all ineligible, this is a flat line, the slope is zero. Um, conversely, after we cross the eligibility threshold, for every dollar increase in students' need, there's a statutory increase in their Pell Grant award of a dollar if they were full-time full year. And empirically, we see about a 70% increase in their expected Pell Grant award. So this is a discontinuous change in the relationship between EFC and Pell Grant aid caused by the kink in the program schedule, which I can use in the aptly named regression kink design. OK, great. So. For those of you who like econometrics, here's a brief segue. For the rest of you, you can tune out for a second, because hopefully all will be clear. Um, the regression kink design, if you haven't heard of it, is very similar to the re regression discontinuity design. We're taking advantage of changes in the level or the slope of Pell Grant aid right at this eligibility threshold. And the key assumption I need to make to use this to say something causal is that Basically, students who are on either side of this threshold have imperfect control over their expected family contribution, and they're essentially going to look the same in terms of their observable and unobservable characteristics. So we can think of students on either side as being as good as randomly assigned to receive, say, a $0 Pell Grant award or a $400 Pell Grant award. Um, essentially, this is assuming individuals cannot fully manipulate their expected family contribution to move from, say, this point to this point, right? So this is a point where I usually get a lot of questions and I'll try to clear, um, clear things up in advance. The argument I am not making is that students and families take no action to increase their need, right? So we all know there's online calculators you can use to estimate your expected family contribution now. There's lots of guides about what what actions you can take to maximize your need, maximize your financial aid, that's okay. All I need is for this person right here to not realize ahead of time, oh, I'm not gonna get a Pell Grant, I need to do this X, Y, and Z to get a $400 Pell Grant, right? And so, first I'm going to give you sort of institutional details why this won't be happening, and then I'm gonna show you things in the data that suggest this won't be happening. So first of all, many of the inputs for the FAFSA 
depend on information that you're reporting in your tax return, such as AGI. Um, but in many years, where this threshold actually falls um, is not reported until after the end of the tax year, right? So sort of everything that is going into your 1040, into your tax return, has already been fixed. The tax year is over. Um, you could still lie on your FAFSA, right? You could put in a different AGI, but actually around one third of all FAFSAs are audited through the Department of Education's verification process. This is much, much higher than the IRS audit rate. Um, and in recent years, there's becoming more and more linkages between the data report to IRS and data report to Department of Education, making it easier to audit these FAFSAs. So you can lie, but chances are you will be found out. Um, the other thing that I'm going to show you, yes? How often do they catch people? This is, so they report this data online. I do not know it off the top of my head. Um, and that, so the question is, are they catching people who are cheating or are they catching people who are confused and right. by the massive complex FAFSA form and not understanding what they need to report? So those two things are hard to disentangle. Um, okay, so, so I made this argument. Students are not sort of manipulating this measure of need. Um, there's also things we should see in the data. So for instance, if we plot the number of students with a particular EFC, um, and this is just a standardized measure of the number of students, we shouldn't see a jump in the number of students right at the Pell Grant eligibility threshold. If we saw a jump, this would suggest that sort of students were realizing they were right over here and doing something to become eligible for Pell Grant aid, and we see no jump. Um, we can also look at the distribution of observable characteristics which I'm happy to talk about afterwards. I'm not going to show you now for the interests of time. Um, but sort of all evidence in the data suggests sort of what we might expect, that students have imperfect control over this measure of need, um, and they're not able to perfectly choose their expected family contribution to, max, to um, take advantage of the, the eligibility threshold. Great. OK, so really quickly, I'm going to go through what we would expect to see in the data if, say, schools were capturing 100% of Pell Grant aid, and if, on the other hand, schools were capturing no Pell Grant aid. So I've drawn this stylized depiction of the Pell Grant program schedule, where sort of everyone is a complier, everyone attends full time. We've got a change in the level of $400 due to the minimum Pell Grant award, and a change in the slope, or this relationship of negative one, right? Your need increases by a dollar, you get a dollar more Pell Grant aid. OK, what would happen if there was no crowd out? So what this blue line is representing is a hypothetical relationship between institutional grant aid and need, right? And what we're really looking for is what's happening right around the place where the Pell Grant changes discontinuously. And here in this hypothetical scenario, there's no change in the slope and there's no change in the level, right? So students on either side who are as good as randomly assigned to say get $400 of Pell Grant aid or get $0, get the same amount of institutional aid. OK, so what would we expect to see if there was full crowd out, if schools captured students' Pell Grants dollar for dollar? Well, what we would expect to see if schools are responding through this institutional aid mechanism is both a discontinuous decrease in how much institutional grant aid you're getting, right? You get $400 more Pell Grant aid, the school reduces your grant by $400, and a change in the relationship, because as your need increases, you get more Pell Grant aid, but then your institutional grant aid sort of follows dollar for dollar, right? So these are all hypotheticals. I just want um, to make clear what we're looking at in the data and what we're looking for. OK, so now I'm going to show you what's actually in the data. Um, and this figure is graphing, A, the relationship between Pell Grant aid and need, um, similar to what I showed you a few slides ago, and the relationship between institutional grant aid and need around the eligibility threshold. Um, and each of these markers is going to be demeaned to take into account um, that I'm look the fact that I'm looking at four different years of data, so I'm including your fixed effects, and I'm including school fixed effects to take into account that students are attending different schools. So I'm just taking out the average, say, institutional grant aid for students attending Washtenaw Community College versus University of Michigan, although there's very few Pell Grant recipients, um, to take into account their sort of unobservable differences. Um, so, so what is going on here compared to those pictures I just showed you? 
Well, if we look at the level of Pell grant aid, right at the threshold, what do we see? We see a discontinuous increase in the level of Pell grant aid. So students get $400, say, more of institutional grant aid, and they also get more Pell grant aid. This would suggest that schools respond to Pell grant aid by increasing institutional aid, or that Pell grant aid crowds in institutional aid. And I can put this into an econometric framework and estimate that if we just look at the change in the level, that schools respond to a dollar of Pell Grant aid by increasing institutional grant aid by 50 cents. Okay, so that's one story, right? What happens if we look at the change in the slope here? So as for students that are eligible, as their Pell Grant, can I tell you that yeah. For a second? Is there any evidence that um, schools are using similar formulas to the Pell Grant eligibility threshold? Is that what at least some places are like? Oh, well, you know, if you if we if we if we deem that you know you are eligible for Pell Grant, then we also deem you worthy. Is that is that evidence of that? So that's a possibility. Uh -huh. um, There's a lot of schools. I'm sure. Yeah, a lot of states. So, so, okay. So the, the, but the EFC, so where students are who qualify for the minimum Pell Grant Award is changing over time. So it, it would have to be not just sort of a relationship between this measure of need and the provision of state grant aid, but also the fact that on one side of this particular value of EFC in a given year, students are getting Pell Grant aid. No, I agree many, with that, but many states see, have those rules. We I mean, see right. the state grant program. EITC and state Right. So you're saying that what is what is the? So sorry. So I guess what I'm saying is that there there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a possibility that you know, um, like other things may, might be happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would plot state grants mm -hmm. the same. Are you going to? No. Because there are definitely state programs. That mm -hmm. are, these programs are only for Pell Grant recipients. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, um, and mm -hmm. I believe there are also, uh, I don't know if Michigan has such a thing. Is, uh, mm, no. is Michigan's named that way? But there are definitely states in which it's mm -hmm. structured yeah. um, uh, such <laughs> that mm -hmm. here's a grant for Pell Grant people. So mm -hmm. what that would matter here in terms of the interpretation is it would is just make the coefficient else smaller going on out yep. there. Yep. That would actually increase this further. Right? The discontinuity would be even greater yes. because exactly. you're also state money. Exactly. Yeah. Are you going to talk about COA? I mean there's a there's a, um, a cost of attendance limit. Right. So I will talk about it now. Okay. Um, <laughs> so when I talked about the Pell Grant program formula, I said a students Pell Grant primarily depends on their expected family contribution and the maximum Pell Grant. There's another component that may matter for students attending very low cost schools or students attending sort of very part time, I guess, and that is the cost of attendance. So cost of attendance equals tuition and fees, um, books and supplies, and living expenses, which depend on where you live. Um, so room and board at dorms, a smaller expense if you're living with your parents, um, an expense if you're not living in the dorms and not living with your parents. And so if this cost of attendance is less than the Pell Grant award you qualify for, then you will only get as much as the cost of attendance. Now what's going on here is that I'm thinking about what's happening to students right around the threshold, right? And so the variation in the Pell Grant award is from, say, zero to a thousand dollars, right? So we would have to have students attending schools that had very low tuition um, or were t attending sufficiently part-time that this cost of attendance requirement would be binding. Um, in practice, around this threshold, this is really not a concern. It's not going on. Um, if the minimum Pell Grant award was much larger, if it was $10,000, then we would worry. We wouldn't worry about this, but this would be something I would talk about more. Um, so this is a constraint, um, but in practice, for the students that I'm looking at, it's not 
going to matter. It's part of the slope, though, too. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. In the sense that you know, you're gonna, as yes. you go out further, you're going to have students who are running mm -hmm. their COA, and their institutional grant is getting mm -hmm. reduced. Okay. Yep, so I can look at remaining need and see if this is a mechanical relationship. I'm not going to show it here, but it's not. So students that are even receiving the maximum Pell Grant award have, on average, even those attending non-selected public schools, which are very cheap, have, on average, I'm not going to get the numbers right. It's in the paper. They have a sufficiently large amount of unmet need that this, once you take into account Pell Grant aid and state grant aid, that this couldn't be a mechanical relationship. Um, but that's a fair point. Yes? So a related point to that and the state aid, I mean, in just doing the same graph for the state aid would basically answer mm -hmm. the question. But even, so I think the point that even if the state aid isn't using exactly the same mm -hmm. threshold as the Pell, which yeah. probably isn't, or maybe it is, I don't know, but even if that's fair, you still could have a problem, particularly with the, R, with the RK, right? Because it's, you know, that's estimating the slope difference on the mm -hmm. other specials. And so even if the threshold was like $100 to the left, that's not going to change your estimate of like the slope, right? Because so much of the data is as to helping to estimate the slope. Yes. So I mean, I can take into account the fact that things might be going on out here by including controls for flexible functions of expected right. family contribution. I can also look at narrower ranges around the threshold, and things stay relatively similar, although they get noisy because I'm losing data. Um, yeah. So to the extent that state grant aid is piggybacking on top of Pell. I just need to um, scale, scale down my estimates by sort of however much um, actual total grant aid is increasing here, right? And I've done that and things look pretty much the same, but I'm not going to show it here. You'll have to take my word on it. Um, if you really care, I'll show you some other time. But um, <laughs> I want to get to the punchline. But are there any other questions first? No. OK, great. So, so if we just look at the change in the level of Pell Grant aid, we would come to the conclusion that Pell Grant aid crowds in institutional grant aid. So schools respond to a dollar Pell Grant aid by increasing institutional grant aid by about 50 cents. However, what happens if we look at the change in the slope of the relationship between institutional grant aid? So remember, as your need increases, you get a dollar more Pell Grant aid, a statutory dollar more, um, empirically about 70 cents. However, for institutional grant aid, as your need increases, your institutional grant aid actually falls. So if we're just looking at sort of how the slope of the relationship between institutional grants and need changes at the threshold, we would actually come to the opposite conclusion that Pell Grant Aid crowds out institutional grant aid by about 20 cents on the dollar, okay? So before I get into interpreting this result, I'm going to show you some heterogeneity across sectors. And the first is looking at public institutions. Now note that these two scales, these two axes have different scales. And again, I'm plotting the relationship between institutional grant aid and need. Um, this sort of black short dashed line here is just um, extrapolating from this relationship between institutional grant aid and need for ineligible students. What this is basically saying is, if we think sort of this represents how colleges are giving out aid depending on need, this line will represent the counterfactual of how much grant aid Pell Grants would have gotten, Pell Grant recipients would have gotten if the Pell Grant program didn't exist, right? Um, but if we focus right around the eligibility threshold, we can really see that public institutions are leading the charge here in terms of this crowd in. And I'll quantify sort of how much is going on here. Um, if we look at non-selective private institutions, so this is grouping together for-profits and open admissions non-profits. And I'll show you in a few slides that these schools are behaving similarly to Pell Grant aid. We don't see any change in the level at the threshold. And we do see a change in the slope, suggesting that um, the only thing going on here is crowd out. Um, and then finally, we can look at more selective nonprofit institutions. And I always want to make clear here that these are not um, going to be the Columbia's and Harvard's. These are just nonprofit schools that have some criteria for admission. They're still admitting most of their students. And in this case, we see the largest degree of crowd out. So note again that we have different scales on these axes, um, suggesting that for every dollar Pell Grant aid received by students attending these schools, their institutional aid falls um, by a substantial amount. Okay, 
So what I'm showing you is that there's a lot of heterogeneity across sectors. So how schools respond to Pell Grant aid is going to vary depending on whether they're a public, a nonprofit, um, or, a for, or a less selective nonprofit. Um, and in the paper, I go through a model suggesting that this is not, these patterns that we observe are not consistent with a world where schools maximize profit. So they respond to Pell Grant aid to maximize profit. So this is reasonable. No one, I'm not going to stand here and argue that we all thought public schools were profit maximizers. That's not realistic. Um, but we can think of an alternative framework where schools have preferences over the characteristics of students they serve, right? So they may care about serving students that are um, from different economic backgrounds, geographic backgrounds, and they may care about whether or not you receive a Pell Grant, right? And so in this world, receiving a Pell Grant affects how the school treats you or sort of their willingness to pay for you to come. So why might schools care about Pell Grant recipients? Well, schools might simply have preferences for diversity, right? They may care about having lower income students in their population. Um, the US News and World Report recently started reporting the percentage of students in each school that are receiving Pell Grants, so this may be a reputation issue. Um, talking to fundraisers, one of the statistics that is most effective in getting people to donate is we are, you know, 30% of our students are needy, they're receiving Pell Grants, we serve a needy population, why don't you contribute? Um, and then finally, thinking about state grant aid programs. Um, so the framework I have in mind here is not necessarily the one um, that has been mentioned, but there are some states that give schools a lump sum amount of grant aid, depending on, in part, the neediness of their student body. So you get more Pell Grant recipients today, you can get more grant aid from the state in the future period, right? So this might be another reason why states would care about serving Pell Grant recipients. Um, that graph that you had before with the more selective uh, uh, non-profit non schools, mm -hmm. um, were you able to also kind of do a similar graph where you just orbited it to like schools that are ranked by the U.S. News and World Report to see if that plays the role? Yeah, so I would love to do that, right? I run out of data when I start cutting the data that finally. So I, there's a reason why I show you these graphs for students way out, you know, away from the eligibility threshold. Um, it's because I don't have enough data to sort of get reliable estimates. And when I start cutting into smaller and smaller categories, it just makes the problem worse. Um, something I would love to look at with different data. Um, so anytime the Department of Education wants to provide me um, with similar information, I could definitely look at that. But that's not a question I can answer. Yes, Kevin. Um, how does merit aid fit into this? So I, this wouldn't be a concern with the R, RD, but with the R kink um, in that mm -hmm. EFC potentially is correlated with ability, academic achievement or something. Mm -hmm. and so if you're talking about the students way on the left-hand mm -hmm. side, right. um, they might have sort of lower achievement scores and they get less merit aid from the institutions. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to this argument that my estimates are thinking about student or are coming off of students right around this eligibility threshold, right? And so you may not believe that as I flexibly control for expected family contribution, that's eating up sort of all of the relationship between schools' willingness to give merit aid and need. Um, I can look at sort of narrower windows and the results get noisy, but they're consistent. And that, and so the RD only makes sense right around the threshold and our kink inherent, like by definition, requires observations away from the threshold. But not sort of necessarily large away from the threshold, yeah. right? In the same way the regression discontinuity requires observations, right? I guess in the limit you need just one on either side, with the regression kink you need two, but... <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so, so sort of if any of these reasons cause schools to care more about, not care more, but care about whether, you're not, whether or not you're a Pell Grant recipient, then there's going to be two things going on as students move from being Pell Grant and eligible to eligible, right? There's going to be a change in your outside aid. You're getting Pell Grant aid, right? And the school would like to capture this regardless of whether they're profit maximizing or care about other things. So they have sort of the maximum amount of resources to redistribute sort of in the way they'd like. But then students also receive a label of being a Pell Grant recipient, and this may affect 
some school's willingness to pay for them. And this is going to work um, in the opposite direction if sort of any of these channels are working, right? You get a Pell Grant, you are more valuable in the school's eyes, and they're willing to provide more grant aid for you. Um, so I do some fancy econometrics, which I'm happy to talk about afterwards, um, but I can basically disentangle these two separate parameters using these two, using the kink and using the discontinuity, and estimate on one hand how much of each dollar of Pell Grant aid is captured or is crowded out by reduction in institutional grant aid, and then how much does this labeling effect change schools' willingness to pay for Pell Grant recipients. Um, and overall, I estimate that 20 cents of every Pell Grant dollar is crowded out by a reduction in institutional grant aid. So I get $100 of Pell Grant aid, which results in me getting $20 less of institutional grant aid. So my total grant aid package increases by $80. $80. However, for students that are right around this eligibility threshold, um, for students that are receiving Pell Grants, this labeling effect leads schools to provide an additional 330 or an 18% increase in institutional aid um, because of this labeling effect, okay? So right around this eligibility threshold, this willingness to pay is going to dominate, which would, if we're just looking at these students, lead us to conclude that Pell Grant aid increases institutional aid, when overall this is not the case. So you're gonna put them both together? Yes. Okay. Um, but first I'm going to look at different sectors. Um, so here I've broken out schools by their control and their selectivity. So these top two are public institutions that are open admissions or more selective. This first parameter is what I'm calling pass-through or the capture. So you can think of every dollar of Pell Grant aid among open admissions public schools leads to an 11 cent decrease in institutional aid. Um, among more selective public schools, it leads to a 13 cent decrease. But due to this willingness to pay, um, open admissions public schools direct $220 additional dollars to Pell Grant recipients, which is a 92% increase at the mean. Um, and selective schools um, provide an additional $860 to Pell Grant recipients, which is a 120% increase at the mean. Okay, but focusing on the remainder of these schools, so these are, this third row is the Open admissions nonprofit schools, there's no sort of preferences for Pell Grant recipients, no willingness to pay, 18 cents of every dollar. A Pell Grant aid is crowded out. Um, in the for-profit sector, I estimate that crowd out is around 10 cents on the dollar, or 10%, um, which is actually the lowest <laughs> of them all. And um, finally, if you remember that third graph I showed you with the sharpest kink, um, as that would suggest, students in attending more selective nonprofit schools experience the greatest degree of crowd out. So every dollar of Pell Grant aid leads to a 72 cent reduction in institutional grant aid. Um, and there may be some willingness to pay here, but it's very noisily estimated, so I'm not gonna hang my hat on it. Okay, so bottom line here is yes, we can say something about differences in objectives. Um, public schools clearly seem to place value on the fact that they're serving Pell Grant recipients. Crowd out is largest among selective, more selective nonprofit schools. And open admissions, non, um, nonprofits and for-profit schools have the, you know, on average, the smallest degree of crowd out. Okay, yes? So they're putting this together with um, Cellini and Golden would have the dependent variable in net, net price. Yes, and that would suggest a very different answer, right? Well, I don't know. It might, maybe only for the for-profits. I mean, basically, you're manipulating something, and it, but, but you could do this, right, with net price as the dependent I'm looking within, aid. I'm looking within schools. Yeah, I'm looking. you've got multiple years. So their evidence, yep. I thought, indicated that okay. the, um, the tuition was getting moved mm -hmm. around, essentially, mm -hmm. as the pel as, got moved right. around. So you just re-specify this as mm -hmm. posted price minus institutional aid, and I assume you would see these converge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is right. interesting. You're interpreting this as differences in preferences, and it could be differences in mechanisms that are yes. used to execute preferences. No, this is an important caveat, right? If these schools find it easiest to raise tuition because all of their students are receiving Pell Grants, then this is not capturing the whole story. Right. Um, exactly. And I will raise that again before the end, before we conclude sort of for-profits are capturing the least. Um, but in terms of 
this particular identification strategy right now, I'm looking within schools within years, right? And so I, I could look within schools across years. I have to think about that. Um, it would be cool if I was able to say something mm -hmm. about the, the net price mechanism. Okay, so Sue asked, can we put this together and say something about the overall degree of crowd out? So on average, how much of every $100 of Pell Grant aid is passed through to all schools or to schools in a particular sector? So we're back to our um, very nice hypothetical diagram here where this green line again is this hypothetical depiction of the Pell Grant award, right? We've got the discontinuity and the kink. And this blue line is sort of an exaggerated version of what I observe in the relationship between institutional grant aid and need, where there's this discontinuous increase and the change in the slope. Right, so this is what we see in the data. Okay, so what assumption am I going to make? The assumption I'm going to make, which I talked about a little bit earlier, is that if we look at this relationship between institutional grant aid and need, for students who are just barely not eligible for Pell Grant aid, we can use that to extrapolate and predict how much these students who are receiving Pell Grants would have received an institutional grant aid if there was no Pell Grant program, right? And so that's what this dash line is. That's the counterfactual or the hypothetical relationship between institutional grants and needs for students that are receiving Pell Grants if the world was one where there was no Pell Grant program. Now this is imposing some assumptions on the data um, that I can say some, that I can look at you know, these people here and say something about these people there that are going to be very different, okay? So, these results you should look at with a little bit more skepticism than the ones I was showing you in the past, which was saying what's going on right around this threshold. Okay, so if we look at this area under the green dash line, this is the total amount of Pell Grant aid that the federal government is giving to students, right? We add up the Pell Grant awards and we add up how many students are receiving each one and that's, that's that $35 billion. Um, this area here underneath this dash hypothetical line is how much grant aid from the school, these students would have received in the absence of the Pell Grant program. And conversely, this area under the actual institutional aid line is how much students actually receive, right? And so we put these two areas together and they give us um, triangles A and B, which are representing the winners and the losers. So people in triangle B are the winners, right? They're actually getting more institutional grant aid, so they're getting this amount, than they would have in a world with no Pell Grant or aid, Pell Grant program due to this willingness to pay. Um, and conversely, the people in triangle A are the losers. So they're getting less Pell Grant aid, um, sorry, less institutional aid than they would have gotten in a world with no Pell Grant program, right? So we have to sort of account for the winners and losers. Um, we subtract out how much people in triangle B are gaining from how much people in triangle A are losing, and that gives us, and divide it by the total amount of Pell Grant aid going out, and that gives us an estimate of the average percentage of Pell Grant aid that is crowded out um, by schools responding by decreasing institutional grant aid, or how much of every dollar of Pell Grant is passed through from students to schools. So on average, um, around 15% of all Pell Grant aid is passed through to students to schools from students, although if we look sort of at a, the confidence interval, so sort of if we allow there to be uncertainty in this estimate, we um, can bound this amount by falling between 9% and 20%, okay? Um, if we look in public institutions, on average, crowd out is around 4%, so it's very, very small. What this is telling us is that these two triangles, so the total amount being um, lost by the losers and the total amount being gained by the winners is very close to being equal, right? So in the public sector, sort of we know where these captured Pell Grant funds are going. They're going to supplement the Pell Grant of students who are just barely eligible, right? So the funds captured from people in area A are being transferred to students in area B. Um, on average, these open admissions, private schools, so these are nonprofits and for-profits, are getting around 18 cents on the dollar, and these more selective nonprofit schools are capturing close to 70 cents on the dollar. Okay? Great. Yes? So there's two reasons why you could see like a zero mm -hmm. in this 
One is because an institute, uh, a set of institutions just doesn't have institutional mm -hmm. aid, so there's nothing to crowd out. Mm -hmm. So one way to norm this would be as a proportion of the aid that they give out, how much mm -hmm. contributes to crowd out. And the yep. other is that they give out lots of aid, but it's unrelated to the Pell Grant yes. schedule. Yes. So or that these two areas cancel each other out. So which? which? So, I mean, in this case, it's the areas canceling each other out. It's neither, right? So they're giving out aid, they're just... Um, well, some it's aren't giving out as much mm -hmm. aid. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yep. But what this is saying is, on average, the Pell stays the same at those places. The right? There can be a place that doesn't give out much. You could have two places the same tuition price. Mm -hmm. One of them doesn't give out much aid, mm -hmm. and the other one does. The Pell is the same at each. Right. But there's so we're nice getting the weighted average of those two, right? So we're including schools that sort of can't respond because they don't have any institutional aid to give out. And schools that can respond, and right? And so, vary across the sectors. right? The so, of those two types yeah. is going to differ systematically yep. across no, the no, sectors. No, no, that's a good point. Um, so, public schools, the open admissions public schools, give out the least amount of aid, right? But we're still seeing this crowd out. So, if I, if I, four percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But this is masking heterogeneity, right? So. These students are gaining and these students are losing, and they're approximately equal. Um, so it's a zero overall, but it's representing a lot of transfers between the most needy Pell Grant recipients to the least needy Pell Grant recipients. Like the level of the thing, right? If the level of this thing were way, way down, mm -hmm. that would be another reason why this, yes. right? Mm -hmm. This is in percentage terms, right? So it just has to be there's some aid to crowd out. What I would want to do is eliminate schools that absolutely can't, res not eliminate them, but that's, that's sort of part of this picture, right? If you're a school that doesn't respond because you have no aid, we want to take that into account. Um, and that's going to drag these results towards zero. But it's part of the big picture, right? Yes, Sheldon. But I, I do think you'd want to look at that separate. So essentially, yes. the, the difference between the community colleges yes. mm -hmm. which don't have the kind of mm -hmm. aid, and the example of selective yes. uh, private, presumably, if there were no Pell, Harvard would still mm -hmm. fill that in. So it's 100% at Harvard, right? And it's zero at the, if Harvard has this policy that they're going right. to provide aid mm -hmm. to everybody below 50,000. Mm -hmm. then, then all of these people are getting full aid. So right. It's 100% at Harvard, and it's zero at a community college without any. It would be interesting to see mm -hmm. what it's like without some of those. Yes. So, so first to answer the Harvard part, there's very few Pell Grant recipients going to schools that have these policies. By and large, these, are going, these students are going to schools where they are still sort of at risk for remaining cost. So, so they're not schools that have a blanket policy of covering full tuition for students that are poor. Um, it's just the, the nature of where Pell Grant recipients go. But I agree with the second part that it is worthwhile to look at schools who have some margin to respond. Mm -hmm. But if we want to think about sort of the overall response, taking aside the Harvards, which are sort of not, not in this set, these are not Harvards. These are schools that admit 60% of their applicants. Um, so they're just private schools that are nonprofits that have some ad criteria for admission, by and large. Um, so assuming that there's not this mechanical crowd out, I think we still want to take into account schools that don't respond because they have no institutional aid because that's part of this overall big picture. I don't think anyone's arguing about the, 50, the 0.148, mm -hmm. but when you break it down mm -hmm. by sector, yep. it then turns into, well, why? There's differences across sector. And it's because of perhaps its preferences and mm -hmm. perhaps its okay. budget constraint, yep. right? So it could be one of the two. Yep. Your point is well taken. Great. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to argue it's differences in preferences. Stay tuned. If I find something different, I'll change the punchline here. Um, I show that public schools appear to value the fact that a student is a Pell Grant recipient. So there's this labeling effect, which increases schools' willingness to pay for these students. Um, For-profit schools along this margin behave no differently than non-selective nonprofits. I'm not looking at tuition, though, and the big caveat here is that many of these schools may find it more effective to respond by increasing tuition rather than altering institutional aid. Um, I find 
the greatest degree of pass-through among students attending selective nonprofit schools. So this is not a mechanical effect. These students on average have over $10,000 of remaining need. So it's not the fact that they have no need left to fill at the eligibility threshold. Um, and I argue that this may be due to differences in market power. So these schools have fewer competitors, um, and so they can extract larger rents from these students. Um, and sort of the bottom line is under these stronger assumptions that I can trace out the counterfactual relationship between institutional aid and need if there was, in the case of no Pell Grant program, I estimate that on average students' prices fall by 85% for every dollar increase in Pell Grant aid. Um, so if we take this to the data in 2011, like I said at the very beginning, students received 35 billion in Pell Grant subsidies. And this suggests that five to six billion of this amount was passed through from school, students to schools via price discrimination. Now, these are big numbers, but what does this mean for policy? Okay, so does Pell Grant aid increase affordability? This is a resounding yes. So students are receiving the majority of their Pell Grant aid. If we look at how much information schools have, if this was a market where schools were truly profit maximizers, we would not see students getting 85 cents for every dollar. This is actually a large proportion given the setting that we're in. So I want to make that clear. Um, what sort of can we think about doing in order to reduce crowd out? So in order to increase the effectiveness of this Pell Grant aid in reaching the students and reducing their price. Um, so one way that is you know, possibly the most uncontroversial, I don't know, people can argue with me, is to increase students' information about what schools are doing, right? If I know I can go to this school and I'll only get 30 cents of my Pell Grant versus going to school B and I get 90% of my Pell Grant, this may affect my decision, right? But right now, it's really hard to judge what is going on. Um, so students, the most clearly observable um, measure of price is this listed price of tuition, but I'm arguing that there's a large variation in the actual prices students pay. Um, the federal government has started trying to make this information easier to obtain, so they have a net price calculator. You can put in some information about your family circumstances and it will tell you for a given institution sort of on average what students are paying who kind of look like you. Um, and the recent college scorecard is also intended to provide more information to students that may affect their decisions. Um, but neither of these is sort of dealing with the particular problem I am posing today, which is this crowd out um, or this institutional um, aid response to Pell Grant aid. Um, and so one idea would be to use the FAFSA as a tool to provide additional information. So for students that apply through the FAFSA, there could be a way to provide these students in turn with more information than just their expected family contribution. Um, so in the FAFSA, students list what program, um, what school they're interested in attending, and the Department of Education actually has information on what students paid, the net price, um, listed price of tuition minus institutional aid that students paid for that particular program um, if they were able to work with the IRS. Um, and, and so for students that are applying to a particular program, they could actually, there could be a way to help them observe not just the average cost and average institutional aid, but what students with their sort of very specific EFC were getting from this school. Um, there might also be a way to use the FAFSA to provide information about other schools in the local area. So you only list one school, but there's five other schools that are within 20 miles of you. And we could also send you information about how, what sort of institutional aid these schools are giving to their students who look like you, okay? Um, and then the final thing is that um, really we can't just look at sort of overall levels of tuition when thinking about college affordability or even um, overall net price, right? So this is graphing um, the net price that students paid in particular sectors according to whether students were receiving the maximum Pell Grant, so these are the most needy, um, any Pell Grant, or whether they were ineligible. And this is sort of at least letting you judge um, how much institutional grant aid schools are giving to students um, in particular sectors. So for instance, the difference 
in net price between the neediest student and needy students who are not receiving the maximum Pell Grant award is sort of the largest, perhaps, among four-year um, nonprofits and doctoral granting institutions. And I'm not arguing that this figure is the end of the story, right? This is looking across institutions, students that receive Pell Grants are going to different institutions, but something like this would be a useful source of information to say, look at schools in your surrounding area, right? If you were not willing to provide individual, if, if it was impossible to provide individualized information, right? So at least you could say the poorest students are paying less than poor students and students who are ineligible for Pell Grant aid. Okay, yes? Yes. Um, I'm slowly learning this literature on financial aid. Great. For financial aid programs like the Pell Grant, mm -hmm. like student loans, does the federal government give like provide like administrative costs to like grants programs, or is it just like here's the money, <laughs> here's the money, and then just use it because if that if if they don't provide like administrative support, that might be another. I'll let <laughs> the expert answer this question. Uh, well, I mean, no. So these are typically these are just kind of mandates where staff has to be provided in order for schools to meet their kind of minimum functions. Yeah. But the government doesn't provide any kind of subsidies to financial aid offices to staff additional people when they pass a policy that's going to require extra hands to process those dollars. So say like if like I don't know like maybe like grants in general to like university. Funds kind of set aside for like you know uh, administrative support. And would, would, could that could that be like another policy implication for how to get more of the aid to the students? I think that institutions would have a hard time going along with a policy that requires them to hire a certain number of staff when they don't know the institution's needs or kind of like the institution's capability in processing aid. So I think that would be kind of an infringement on institutions themselves in terms of like their payroll and benefits and things like that because likely a grant wouldn't cover that amount, but also um, the government can't really, doesn't specify a number per program that you should have employed in your financial aid office either. Right. So I think it would be, Putting a lot on I, I, I get it. I get it. Okay. So there's there's an administrative allowance that goes with the is it is it and it's hooked to right is this the right phrase that they use that, that FSA uses? Administrative allowance? I believe so. It travels with the and I don't think it's is it per cap like person or per dollar? It's tiny, you know, but basically it's the hidden cost of the programs mm -hmm. that they administer it. Mm -hmm. um, at I'm most sure it's like per two percent or something of two cents on a dollar. It's small. Yeah, it's There's little and mm -hmm. I don't know if it's per dollar or per head. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know off the top of my head yet either. Because um, you think if they do essentially need to recapture the cost of running it, Right? That would be an interesting number yes. to know because yes. that basically this is how they get their overhead. Yes, um, exactly. So that would be a nice, a nice thing to mm -hmm. add to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's something that's probably knowable. Um, okay. So, but just to be clear, these policies that I'm recommending are all sort of demand side policies. So none of them are imposing additional regulation on schools. They're aiming to increase the amount of information students have to maybe help them choose schools where they're get the most bang for their buck. Um, okay, great. So, okay. Oh, sorry, I just have one brief. So with using net price, um, I think that part of the problem with using a kind of a net price framework is the fact that institutions don't necessarily have a uniform awarding methodology. Mm -hmm. um, so as that varies across institutions, that can be kind of an issue in assessing net price. Um, but there's also um, kind of the added issue of small schools might have very few students at a mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. kind of income set that yes. the net price calculator can skew year to year greatly based on that. So you would want to throw out small cells or sort of not base policy decisions on small cells? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have a sense of if there's a, a wide distribution of institutional aid around like EFC price point. So if someone's 
expected family contribution is, let's say, $1,000 under mm -hmm. the health threshold, is there a pretty like wide... Is there a lot of variation? Yeah, what the schools offer, I guess. Uh, if you're looking uh, across all different sectors, yes. Yes. So... Driving it would be, um, could, like, could there be a role in that, given the Pell Grant, students are now more willing to accept like enrollment from the uh, lower end of like this distribution? Um, is that contributing to the widening of the... Right, so all of these, the estimates I'm showing you are looking within schools. So it's not being driven by the fact that students, I don't have the picture, Students over here are attending different schools than students over here. It's all coming from within schools. Right. So I guess I'm, I'm thinking like if, if a school is, if without the Pell, if maybe, you know, the only people who accept, you know, uh, a financial aid package are the people who receive $2,000 or more um, in aid. But now that you get a Pell, you're willing to accept $1,500. Oh, is it changing the types of schools students go to? Yeah. yeah. So this is a really interesting question that also I'd love to address in future research. I can look at that here and I don't find a lot of evidence of sorting across different sectors, right? But this is probably going to depend on what a student specific situation looks like. If there's only one school within 50 miles of me and by and large Pell Grant recipients go to schools that are very local, I'm not probably going, it's not going to matter, right? And so what would be really interesting is to look at students who have choices and whether receiving a Pell Grant affects the choice of what school to go to. So I can say, in my noisy data, I don't see that happening, but that's not going to rule it out, right? Um, and this would just be sort of a different, if, if student, so I can look at measures of school quality, um, okay, and to see if students are upgrading in terms of things like institutional resources, so um, spending on instruction for full-time equivalent, spending on institutional grants for full-time equivalent, and I don't find any evidence of that going on. Um, but that's not to say it's not, right? Um, that's a good point. Okay, so I'm okay. about to be cut off. Cut off. Hooked. All right, so let's uh, thank Berkeley for um, uh, yeah.